A very good day to all of you on yet another session of our FAIR AI's Thought Leader Speak series. We have with us today, Ms. Olivia Gambellin. She's an AI ethicist and is the founder and CEO of Ethical Intelligence Associates. And we will talk with her about ethics in AI and why it matters so much. Welcome to the show, Olivia. Thank you so much for having me here today. So let's start at the very beginning. Uh, what got you excited about ethics and technology in the first place? And especially your journey from uh, San Francisco to Europe. It is quite a journey. Um, so I began my life, so to speak, in San Francisco. So I grew up in the Bay Area in that small little tech bubble. So I grew up surrounded by technology, uh, the fast and the furious, so to say, of it all. Um, constant, constant new technology. We're kind of used as guinea pigs out there um, to test all of the startups and their new tech. Uh, so it was an interesting place to grow up in um, and it instilled in me this, this drive and ambition, so to speak, to change the world um, as that's the tagline for any tech startup you'll meet out in the Bay Area. Um, but truthfully, from there, I moved away from technology for a while and went and did my degree in philosophy uh, specifically ethics and morality. Okay. From there, I actually moved overseas and I was working as a researcher for a while in Brussels, right around the time where GDPR, data privacy, that was all the rage. Um, and I ran across this central conversation about data ethics. And that was my moment where I really found technology and ethics, two of my influences, the great influences in my life coming together. From there, I went back to university to do a master's degree in the ethics of artificial intelligence in Scotland. Um, and from there, actually founded Ethical Intelligence with this drive to bring ethics into tech, uh, be able to implement and put ethics into action, uh, mm -hmm. making it easy for industry and tech in general to understand their ethical implications, understand the more responsibility behind technology, behind the creation of it all. Um, and that's where a lot of that inspiration and my around a bit of the world journey all loops in together. In fact, it's interesting to see how the moment of truth for a lot of people working in the AI ethics domain, uh, especially American for Americans, it actually happens in Europe. Because mm -hmm. I think uh, you must be the third or fourth person we have interviewed so far uh, American, but who actually has, uh, I mean, started off the entire process of working in AI ethics in that uh, sweet spot in Europe rather than in America. So that's an interesting geographical uh, uh, analogy as well. But uh, I mean, uh, from this journey, uh, the offshoot here is that how did it really uh, transform or manifest into a decision to make your own uh, venture, your own enterprise, uh, which is the EIA, uh, rather than working in a technology company and uh, trying to improve their uh, work, uh, work into a more ethical uh, you know, manner. So there's, of course, many paths towards working in AI ethics. Um, how I chose this one, mm -hmm. I was running a society called the Beneficial AI Society which was quite a fun social group. It brought together masters and PhD students. We would meet once a week in a pub and we would discuss current technology debates mm -hmm. um, through the lens of ethics, through the lens of morality. Uh, and it was quite an interesting mix of people. We had computer scientists, we had ethicists, we had people that there were studying law, a um, few business minded folks, and it made for really interesting conversations. Through this process, I had the opportunity to start talking with people in the tech field again, um, introducing the fact that I was helping run this society, the, the conversations that we were having. And through that started noticing there seemed to be a gap between academia, the research that was happening in academia mm -hmm. and actual actionable points for people in industry. So by identifying this, this gap and for all intents and purposes, sitting in it at that point in time, it was a moment of, well, there's an opportunity here. Mm. Um, and the larger corporations, as much as I would love to work in them someday, I think 
uh, part of the inspiration for starting my own company off of that comes from the roots of the Silicon Valley of, no, I've, I'm going to be my own, my own uh, boss. I'm going to start my own it's company. Own baby. Exactly. So, and it really is my own baby now. Um, so part of that was the opportunity and the timing aligned perfectly and the inspiration from my background from, I would call it my heritage in one way, um, considering the cultural aspects that sit within that bubble in, in, in the mm -hmm. Bay Area, uh, all aligned together. And such <laughs> ethical intelligence, my baby was born. So in fact, it's a, uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's a thing of, you know, the iron is hot, so strike while the iron is hot. It's a, the problem exactly. that I'm reminded of. So at EIA, you're essentially an AI ethics consulting uh, firm. So mm -hmm. I mean, tell us a bit about this entire consulting engagement. How do you engage with those clients to help them uh, set up ethical AI standards and frameworks processes in their uh, work? Uh, uh, some examples that you think uh, you know uh, stand out in terms of the situations or the challenges or the resistances you faced from the hitherto, I mean, either the developers or the business managers in those organizations, because they would have their own set way of doing things, their set thought processes, and you had to break the barrier in some sense. So tell us about a bit about the engagement process as well as those experiences. It is quite interesting. I think my introductory conversation usually goes along the line of trying to convince someone that ethics is not a blocker and rather is a stimulator for innovation. Um, oftentimes ethics is put in this box of, well, this tells us what we can and can't do and therefore it's going to hinder any type of innovation. That's often the rhetoric that I hear in these conversations. So usually my first job, even before working with clients is going through this process of convincing them, no, ethics will benefit your business at the end of the day. Um, what it does is instead of limiting you to, instead of, uh, instead of being restricted in a sense to your technical limitations, you have your technical limitations for your technology. Once you add on this set, this set of ethical limitations, you actually have to get more creative, not less creative. You have to get more creative in order to fit within these bound, boundaries. Um, and what that results in is robust solutions rather than something that fits, fits the bill, fits, fits the requirements technically, but ethically and from a societal standpoint, doesn't quite line up or match up. Um, so often engagement is, is, the first step is ethics is good. Um, mm. It's not this, this heavy, it's not another checklist to go through. It's not another set of rules and codes of conduct. It may, manifest that way in terms of management and governance within it within the corporate structure mm. but at the end of the day it actually helps uh inspire well inspire employees and validate the the decisions that they're making it makes them feel that the technology that they're creating is used being used for good instead of thinking have i just created something that will be detrimental to my neighbor um mm. and so what we generally tend to do uh, with our clients is work in one of two directions. We either work in terms of education or equipping them. So education sits along the lines of corporate training. That's a lot of literally sitting down and going through these educational materials, working with employees. Um, we will do a training session for an entire team of developers or the C-suite of a company. It really depends on the company um, and how they're set up internally, but what we do is we work with them to educate them on here are the issues, here are the warning signs to spot, here are the ways that you can start encouraging from a company cultural standpoint, employees to take responsibility, take accountability for the actions for what they're doing with the technology and make sure that they are constantly at least checking back on the ethics and asking those questions, bringing the, those points up if they ever feel that they're, that they're in a position that you know, maybe ethically questionable to feel that they have the ability and that they can be brave enough to actually bring those points up. Um, so that's from an educational standpoint. Mm -hmm. Equipping that really fits in terms of the protocols, the frameworks, the codes of ethics, 
uh, this, the, the wider strategy, mm -hmm. that one is much more structural. And mm -hmm. those kind of projects are put in place on larger organizations because managing the, the ethics behind it all can be very overwhelming if you don't have steps. Um, and so we've worked with clients before in setting up these, they are frameworks that run the entire life cycle of a project. So you start at the beginning, you do your due diligence, you do your research, you set yourself up to understand this. These are the points that we need to watch for. These mm -hmm. are how our stakeholders and our shareholders are going to be interacting with this technology. Mm -hmm. um, here are the questions we need to be asking ourselves either every month, every few weeks, every week even to understand, are we, are we still in line with what our original goal was or are we differing? Are we, are we going in a different direction? And if so, what are the implications of that direction? Mm -hmm. um, so that direction of more equipping works really well if you have many projects that you're trying to manage or you're a larger organization. It allows just for a bit of a standard to be put in place mm -hmm. um, and it helps people understand, okay, here are, here's our code of ethics and here's how we fulfill those code of ethics and here's how we constantly keep ourselves aware that we are working towards this direction. Um, so it's, it's this, this two-prong approach, uh, especially right now, in such a new field, you really need to have both aspects. Uh, I mean, from what you said, actually, I take out uh, uh, three threads, if I may. So mm -hmm. one is that it reminded me of the discourse that happens around, say, business sustainability. So again, sustainability in business is something that has picked up a lot of resistances were happening from the incumbent business managers, but now the sort of pitch that is being told that if you don't become sustainable, there is a big business risk to your longevity. So hence there is a business rationale to do so apart from the good factor. How does this psychology translate in the AI ethics uh, domain? Do, I mean, are the managers that you are interacting with at your client companies uh, starting to see this as a business rationale as well that my long-term longevity of my enterprise will be uh, severely hampered or there will be a risk factor if I do not inculcate certain responsible and ethical practices in the way I'm developing my technology AI algorithms. That's one uh, part. The other part is that right now, say we are in a post-COVID stress, economic stress situation. Now, often uh, in times of stress in the economy, often checks and balances sometimes go for a toss. I'm not saying everywhere, but in certain cases, certain times it happens. So how do you see the clients, uh, you know, uh, the thought process on responsible AI pre-COVID and now? Is there a difference that you see, uh, your views on these two things? Okay, I will tackle the sustainability risk question first, and then we'll go, we'll go to the COVID one. Um, often how I describe ethics, the, the use of ethics in day-to-day -day business is actually monitoring for ethical risks. Mm -hmm. um, these work the same as sustainability risks. They go quite well hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of what this transition is, is moving from short-termism to the quick solution and uh, we can get this out the door and it will turn a quick buck and we're done. Mm -hmm. Into the mindset of actually we're trying to establish a company that can stand the tests of time, that can stand, with, withstand a pandemic, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of what the ethical consideration does is monitor for risks to the company's reputation mm -hmm. as well as to the company's technology. Um, for example, if you build a, an AI system um, as you're building it, and if you're not paying attention to the ethical implications, you're creating, um, as we would call technical debt, you're creating ethical debt. You're creating all these holes that can later come back to hurt you because you, you didn't go back and fix them um, before the technology went out. Um, so ethics works in that same direction. It's, it's not in ones and zeros, but it is, um, it is just as heavy, can have just as strong of implications for the company and the technology 
just as a technical um, mishap would as well. Um, so that's from the ethical risk point of view. And then in terms of COVID, it's actually been a very interesting process. Um, mm. As we saw the pandemic take hold, one of our worries was all of this time and effort and all of the progress that not only ethical intelligence, but the AI ethics community at large had made in technology. Uh, mm. There was this fear that, well, this is just going to be pushed out the door because there are all of these other concerns um, that 2020 has brought us, but that ethics would kind of be pushed out the door. Instead, what we saw was actually an increase in interest in ethics, um, in technology, in responsible technology, because we saw these real life applications, um, specifically contact tracing applications were a great example mm -hmm. of people going, hold on, I'm not sure I like this technology or hold on, there are privacy concerns or hold on, there, there are ethical concerns to this technology. Um, is it responsible? How are governments using my data? How, how does this benefit me from the individual perspective, from a societal perspective? There was finally this brilliant case study really mm -hmm. that showcased to the world the importance of responsible technology. And we saw that specifically in the cases of these contact tracing applications that weren't necessarily built in full transparency or built in a direction that, that honored privacy, um, that the public didn't trust. It all comes back to trust. The public didn't trust. Those applications didn't get picked up and now they're sitting on a shelf and not being used. So it really emphasized actually instead the importance of building responsible technology because as you build responsible technology, by embedding ethics, you actually are building technology that society that the public trusts in. And if you don't have the trust of your user, your user will no longer be your user. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a very, very interesting um, and hopeful experience. Uh, well, <laughs> we're hoping it's gonna be a little bit more hopeful soon, but from the AI ethics community perspective, we were given this, this case study, this, these examples that now we, we can use very directly and, and talk to people in, in a way that they understand because COVID hit and touched all of our lives. It's much easier for people to visualize now the need for responsible technology. It said that necessity is the mother of invention. So I think, you know, uh, the necessities created by the COVID situation has actually, uh, while However perilous it may have been, it has been a blessing also in a sense when it comes to the entire discourse on ethics, responsible business, or even say in investment space with ESG, et cetera. And suddenly a lot of stakeholders are realizing that, it, you know, when the chips are down, what can help us gain that competitive edge? Maybe these are the elements that can help us do so. And that is actually a blessing in disguise for the entire discourse on responsible practices, ethical practices. And hopefully another five years down the line, unless and until there's another pandemic that hits us and <laughs> derails the process. But hopefully from here, the trajectory uh, should be bullish. Uh, I'll add another, uh, another query. Uh, you mentioned about education and the work on protocols, frameworks, et cetera. Uh, just to understand the existent, uh, you know, dynamics or thought process in the industry, will it be safe to say that if you have engaged on education programs, knowledge uh, programs with say X number of corporations, the number of people who eventually said yes, that we want to institutionalize a set of protocols, a set of frameworks, uh, would be why is there a relationship between x and y that i mean i'm just taking arbitrary numbers imagine you have engaged with four companies on education and one out of those four invariably says yes that we want to institutionalize that is there such a relationship you have or you've observed in the industry so far yes uh, actually what we hope to do is actually have uh well, companies that engage in training also engage in that kind of protocol equipping. Mm -hmm. um, 
again, I'm speaking more on, in terms of larger corporations, because from that perspective, they absolutely need the type of protocols and frameworks mm -hmm. in order to handle these, these issues. For them, it's an added benefit to have mm -hmm. their employees also educated mm -hmm. because that means that the protocols and frameworks aren't these checklists that people are begrudgingly going through and making sure because you know, their manager told them to. Mm -hmm. Instead, they're educated about the importance of them. And so they have the intention to follow through on these protocols. Um, so from a large corporation perspective, it actually works in the opposite direction of you go protocol to education. Whereas from an SME, more startup, smaller, smaller industry, uh, smaller enterprises perspective, mm -hmm. they start from education to protocol. So they first seek to educate themselves. And it's through that education that they realize, okay, well, you know, if we have a code of ethics, it makes it easier for us to follow as a company. And with that, we can start to have a protocol built off of that. And that helps us follow step by step that code of ethics. Um, so both sides, just because of the, the sheer size of mm -hmm. these companies, uh, they work in different, they work towards the similar goal. Mm -hmm. Having both ends really is the best way. It creates the most robust uh, ethical protocol, overall ethical system um, for these companies. Um, but the, the two follow a different path. Any particular uh, examples of organizations, institutions, or companies you can share from all these experiences who actually stood out in terms of ethical AI practices? Yes, actually. Uh, so we worked with the Data for Children Collaborative with UNICEF. Um, they were one of our first clients, actually. And you can see the entire framework that we designed with them on their website. Um, actually, it's their, their entire framework as well as their code of conduct. They call it their compass. Um, and the collaborative did an amazing job working with us. Uh, essentially, what they do is they work alongside with UNICEF. Um, they're UK based, so UNICEF and the N NHS. Mm -hmm. And they design research projects um, around how do we take all of the data that we have here on children and use it to help children. But because children are such a highly sensitive group, how do we do this with ethics at the forefront of our mind? Um, and so their framework is actually built to last the entire life cycle of their projects. Um, and it's very, very robust. Um, and actually, we also have an interview up on our, on our own blog where we touched base um, with the director of the collaborative a year later and asked her, how has this changed? What has developed? Um, how has this worked for you over the past year of utilizing this framework for your projects? And she was saying, she goes, it's still, we're still a work in progress of learning exactly what our employees need in terms of being able to fulfill this framework. But that alone has been invaluable to us, understanding that as we approach with our employees, okay, what do you need to be able to reach this principle, to fulfill this ethical principle and work side by side with them? So it's still uh, a case by case basis as they implement the framework. Mm -hmm. And with each project, they're going, okay, it looks a bit different this way um, because we have a different set of people. But each time she says, we, we come out with solutions that are far greater than we would have expected and we have confidence in them, that, they're, that these are solutions that we can trust. Mm -hmm. And that alone is just, is priceless. Um, so the Data for Children Collaborative with UNICEF, it's a very long name, but they are an amazing example. They're doing some great work up, uh, they're housed up in Scotland out of the Bay Center in Edinburgh University. Really worth checking out what, actually what their projects are as well. Um, they do some great work up there. In fact, it's uh, fantastic that a young enterprise like you are working with, uh, you know, institutions like NHS and UNICEF. In fact, a term I recently heard, so, you know, you all, uh, I mean, every so often these fancy terms are get, uh, get coined. So there's this term called, pop at, you know, creating change at population scale. So it's a very fancy way of saying that creating scale at a very big, uh, you know, level. 
And obviously, uh, if we're talking about institutions like UNICEF and NHS, which literally cover the entire country, the nation, uh, with their work, uh, in uh, so I am I'm sure that you know the impact of your work as well would be reaching population scale uh, in that sense. Uh, in fact, so while UK may be one example, just based on your uh, you know the research or the reading you may have done. Uh, how do you view, say, a similar project happening in a developing country, an em emerging economy, where the scale is even probably 3x or 4x what it would be in Scotland? It's quite what, what, a I mean, rather, let me rephrase the question. What would be the additional challenges for you as a service provider in this space were you to do a similar, say, UNICEF project in a country like India or Indonesia? where the population is uh, you know mind boggling as compared to scotland absolutely that scale is completely uh well it's far different um so each culture each country that these kind of projects are based in have the have a very contextual relevance so working in scotland we were working very closely um we are a network of experts, uh, consultancy experts, um, consulting experts, there we go. And what we did was we worked closely with actually UK residents. Um, so our experts that were employed on, the, on that project were UK residents. Mm -hmm. They saw the direct impact. Um, so if we were to shift into, let's say, India, we would contract, we would work with experts based in India. Um, because the cultural context adds in a whole nother layer where, um, yeah. for example, in Scotland, um, we were one of the one of the projects that the collaborative worked on that we actually used as a as a tape as a test case for our framework in the very beginning was this project to reduce child obesity in Scotland. That's yeah. a problem in Scotland. That's something we had to consider within the Scottish context that wouldn't necessarily even apply in India. Um, and so each culture, each, each culture provides its own context and actually working with people from that culture is essential. You, you, can't, you can't create something for a country if you're not creating it with the people from that country. Um, Cause there are, there are cultural nuances that I won't understand. Yeah. Um, even if I'm reading papers, I just won't understand them. So I need to be able to instead sit down with someone that that is their day-to-day -day life and figure out, okay, how do we then take that cultural relativity and implement it better into these kind of systems? In fact, uh, I mean, your answer reminded me of that. Uh, it's not just about say, uh, the different context in a country, say like India or whatever, because even within some of these large developing countries, the because they are so head, heterogeneous, not just in culture, but also in the evolution, the economic evolution of recent years, uh, I still, I mean, I'm just sharing a uh, personal anecdote. I'm based in a city called Mumbai, which is the, you know, one of the New York equivalent of India. And, uh, I was for a year last year posted in a small town in provincial part for a certain agriculture, sustainable agriculture project. And believe you me, every time, every other weekend when I would come home to Mumbai, uh, I, the first thing that would catch my notice between the two airports would be the obesity of the people because in cities like Bangalore, Mumbai, Delhi, because the economic evolution, lifestyles has changed so much that people are growing. I mean, I'm reminded of Harry Potter's Dudley Dursley <laughs> that grew wider than they grew tall. Whereas in provincial towns, if you go where the lifestyle and the eating dietary habits is still much more healthier. So the people are much more healthier. So even within a country, I mean, it, the same holds true for China. When you go to Sichuan or uh, Yunnan, it's as different from uh, the North in Tianjin or Dalian. So you know, within the country, there are segments and which create its own challenges for service providers, uh, mm -hmm. not only in AI ethics like yourself, but every other service uh, for that matter. Uh, Olivia, you mentioned about uh, 
ethical risk which you call as ethical debt and i really like that because the word debt would ideally raise the ears of a lot of business managers because it's a balance sheet phrase and financial phrases catch their interest more than anything because of legacy uh, reasons so uh, in this entire discourse of ethical risk innovation uh, responsible technology you have already said uh, i mean you have already shared your views to a certain extent uh, one uh, in i mean one point i would like to add here is that when you have different audiences like technology developers uh, people who are actually thinking of solutions and innovations people who are the business who are handling the business operations so there are different audiences you would be interacting with so how is the experience on the entire discourse of ethical risk ethical debt when you talk with these people how is it different between these various buckets of people which bucket so, responds more which bucket responds less and why so um it's quite interesting because i get different responses from people in each bucket um, I would say in terms of approaching people from a more technical background, your developers, your engineers, your programmers, um, often those conversations need to be approached as I'm not coming to tell you what you're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm coming to help you do a better job. Do mm -hmm. actually, oftentimes uh, these, these developers, these programmers want to, in, in the common terminology being used nowadays, do good by their tech. Mm -hmm. um, this is actually a way to empower them to be able to do that. So by speaking with an ethicist, they can actually validate the, the decisions that they're making or catch something that may be off beforehand. And so they don't have this, this weight of guilt of maybe, maybe that decision I made came across wrong. And maybe the reason, maybe I labeled that data set wrong. And because of that, uh, all these people are being negatively impacted. No, it, it, it's like, um, oftentimes I have to approach this, this bucket as, hey, I am your sidekick. I am, I'm here to support you, not to implement my, my own uh, framework, not to force my own ethical values on you. No, I'm here to help you mm -hmm. make sure that this technology that you're creating is really technology for good, um, down to this nitty gritty level. On the flip side, when approaching people in terms of more business operations, management, higher up level, um, the conversation usually goes in terms of, okay, well, what does this mean on uh, the balance sheet? How does this increase business for us or protect us from detrimental uh, decisions that could hurt the business? Um, they're also the ones that, that I need to speak to on a higher level. Um, Meaning instead of talking details uh, down to the labeling of data sets or uh, supervised versus unsupervised learning and that kind of thing, um, as I would from a developer standpoint, I'm speaking from a high level of, well, who are the people impacted by the overall usage of this technology? Is it just your target user base or are you also unintentionally impacting another subgroup that you, that you weren't aware of? Mm -hmm. um, and again, from both directions, you find people that are very receptive to the talk, to the talk of ethics. Um, and then you have ones that are just completely closed off. Um, it's really, really based on the person. Um, I can't really put them into buckets other than uh, from a business management operations side, it's speaking on ethics in terms of this high level uh, it's having this idea of, okay, if you are ethical, it's better for your business just for X, Y, and Z between innovation and risk and debt. It's better. It's a better business plan. It's long-term rather than short-term. Um, on the flip side, when, when I'm talking to programmers, developers, engineers, that's detailed. That's very, very detailed. Both directions, it's support. Mm -hmm. um, but it is, it is interesting. I can never, I can never predict if I'm going to be well received or approached as, oh no, here comes, here comes the ethicist to come tell us that we're doing everything wrong. Mm -hmm. Because ethics is very closely related to our understanding of ourselves as humans, but also our individuals. So you have to be very careful approaching these conversations. I can't come in and say, 
no, nope, you made a poor ethical decision. Mm -hmm. I have to, because it's going to come across as an attack on you as a person, mm -hmm. because you're going to think, well, then I'm a bad person. I must be a bad person if I made a bad ethical decision. That's not true. You made, you made a decision within your own ethical framework. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that framework isn't the best framework mm -hmm. to be using in that, that situation. So it's just approaching going, okay, why'd you make this decision? Okay, let's consider it from this angle and let's tweak it here so that it helps people, uh, it helps uh, in this direction rather than uh, in this direction. So um, they're tricky conversations. They're very tricky conversations. You're never quite sure what you're going to get mm -hmm. in terms of reception on the other end. Yeah, it's interesting when you say that it really depends on the person in question rather than because that really brings out the entire discussion on how ethics and technology is being taught, say at the college levels, or it is being used at recruitment or corporate trainings uh, in order to bring the level of awareness of across individuals at a par. But we'll come to that a bit later. Before that, I want to go back to an interview you have given previously uh, to the plat uh, to the uh, you know the very well known platform called All Tech is Human. Uh, I'm citing from your interview there that uh, you said that uh, about the way humans are that we approach humans approach challenges in a very messy manner. Uh, we learn through our hard experiences and we support each other through connection. Now I'm just connecting this thought with the entire debate on when will artificial intelligence become at par match with human intelligence so if ai is actually going to match human intelligence eventually uh, how do you see this entire human angle in this uh, question how can these elements uh, be incorporated in a ai algorithm so that eventually ai and hi actually match is it possible what are your views on this so from my point of view, you can have a rational based AI system and potentially one day it may be able to reach the point where uh, from a rational point of view, from a logical point of view, it can match a human. Um, again, it's people on the other end of this. So it's really just us reiterating our own intelligence into a system. Um, I do not believe it'll ever be able to reach the same intelligence level as a human in general because as humans as you said i like to emphasize the fact that we're messy people are messy and there's a beauty in that um, we're not just using logical inputs when it comes to decision making we're using our emotions we're using our gut reactions we're using uh, our social interaction and how how we feel around other people even as inputs and from my point of view, that's so nuanced and it's so contextually based. It depends on the people in the context. It depends on what they ate for lunch. It depends on uh, what they're doing tomorrow, what's in their minds, their backgrounds. That all factors into what human intelligence is. Uh, human intelligence isn't just X plus Y equals Z. It's X plus a whole world of a background equals who knows what you're going to get on the other end, but there's something beautiful about that. Um, and I want, I always try and say that we as a human race, we, we need to be brave to embrace this messiness. Um, Cause they're within that messiness. That's something good. We don't have to automate that. We don't have to optimize it. There's something good and beautiful about being able to struggle through life and overcoming challenges and using AI as a tool to help us, um, but why, why would we want to offload all of these things that make life worth living onto a system? Mm -hmm. um, but that, that is, that's my, my personal point of view. Mm -hmm. It's a, a, a debate of trying to bring order within chaos, if I can uh, call it that. Yes, whether exactly. Is, whether that is appropriate or not, again, would probably depend on the person to person. So it's a, uh, but then also say, for example, uh, you mentioned earlier in this conversation that in during your days in San Francisco in the Silicon Valley, for instance, uh, a lot of these startups, then, I mean, 
a lot of those startups who became the big tech corporations that we know today, for instance, uh, a lot of them claim that uh, whatever they do, their products and solutions will quote unquote change the world. <laughs> but often it is not so. So what is your, uh, you know, the, your advice or what would you say to those uh, big tech corporations that, listen, uh, this is what we should do to, you know, close that gap. So I'll speak on a very high level here again, mm. um, because big tech and tech in general is we're, we're, we're setting out to change the world. Um, another common phrase we're hearing now is AI for good. Mm. What you need to ask yourself in these situations is who's good? Yeah. Who's good are we, are we using AI for? Is it for you know, the, the same subset of people sitting in the Bay Area and their high, high level office desk jobs that this AI will make their life slightly easier. Mm -hmm. Is that actually good? And at what cost do we get that small little ounce of potential good? Mm -hmm. um, so really slowing down and asking who's good, whose definition of good are we using? Who is have, receiving this good mm -hmm. quote unquote? And same with, this, with the same rhetoric for we're changing the world. Okay, who are you changing the world for? How are you changing the world? I would argue that big tech is changing the world, but I don't think in the direction that they originally set out to do. Um, for example, social media companies, there is significant research saying that the use of, social, of these social media platforms have resulted in increasing polarization in our political sphere, in our, in our, societal, in our societies that's a change in the world. Is that a change we actually wanted though? Mm -hmm. So being able to critically examine from this high level perspective, innovation for innovation's sake is not good. Yeah. Innovation does not imply good. Instead, you need to look at innovation as a tool, as a step in the right direction of something that you need to get to your end goal. But what is your end goal? And for who, who are you impacting with that end goal? In fact, your point reminded me of a very debatable uh, sentence, but let me uh, say it here that, uh, I mean, I once heard somewhere, so say amongst the social media platforms, say something like, I mean, I'm using Twitter, but it's nothing personal against Twitter. So I hope no Twitter person uh, <laughs> is me on this. But it's just an observation that I heard that saying that, sometimes giving too much power to the person, democratizing the access of a lot of services, sometimes may not always be the best solution. And that sort of connects with the sentence that you just said, that innovation just for innovation's sake is not always good. So because today every, you know, every 7 billion of the people that we have on the planet, today with a smartphone is able to you know, change, uh, you know, uh, give, I mean, even though they may not be aware of the full uh, history geography of something that has happened, but they have full freedom to make a comment and then th those comments, uh, the momentum builds up. Mm -hmm. It may not be based on full truth, but then at the end of the day, uh, you know, sometimes the truth gets lost somewhere. And the only thing that remains is that uh, 2 million followers said this, so it must be right. I mean, that's while that sounds as ridiculous as it may, that's the harsh truth of the world we live in. And the debate that uh, was, uh, you know, the sentence that I'm quoting from a particular incident I was, uh, I had witnessed was that giving too much power. So in this case, the power is basically connotated by giving too much of, I mean, the power of expressing your opinion that these social media platforms has given to each and every person, democratizing the access uh, in that sense is maybe not always good because people are not able to always use it in a responsible manner. You know, a lot of people uh, believe everything coming on WhatsApp and Twitter as gospel truth. And in fact, in the courts of justice, maybe eventually the Bible or the Holy Book will be replaced with Twitter and WhatsApp. And God forbid if that is so. But that is the, and that actually uh, manifests or, you know, uh, accelerates the challenge for people like yourself so much. I mean, uh, for the entire, you know, to drive home the fact that ethics and responsible uh, usage of technology and ethical and responsible consumption of the technology is also important. 
it may makes your job so much more challenging uh, that is probably what i'm taking out from this conversation but uh, i mean while you did say that uh, you know it depends on person to person and innovation is not always uh, for the good uh, because it depends on what type of innovation is it um uh, let's come to the topic of standards and regulations because standards and regulations at least can help us establish a sort of baseline or benchmark that this is what is appropriate this is what is undesirable so what is your view on uh, you know the standards being set in the industry when it comes to ethical ai whether it is by institutions like ieee you have been involved with the european union for instance uh, so i mean who have been in the forefront of a lot of regulations in this space so what's your view on on all the standards and regulation in context of what you just said previously so i am a first and foremost a huge supporter of what ieee is doing mm -hmm. um what they're doing with their ethically aligned design movement and their standards that they have uh issued out and are currently in development um i am very well aware of what goes on behind the scenes in building those the minds that went behind these standards are brilliant the intentions behind them are brilliant um so i'm a, i'm a huge supporter of what ieee is doing um and with that being said the standards these guidelines they are the perfect baseline as you were saying they are the benchmark that is the bare minimum that people that companies need to meet the thing with ethics is it's not a one and done process it's not okay we we meet we we met the the baseline we're done it's okay we've got ourselves up to the standard the baseline we have to continually analyze to make sure that we stay at that level mm -hmm. and then if we want to be truly perceived as ethical by society at large is also go above and beyond um for example a company can be legally compliant for all intents and purposes they can meet a standard and yet still be perceived as ethically questionable mm -hmm. um when it comes down to it at the end of the day so it's understanding what society is expecting of a company as well from from an ethical standpoint so while these guidelines while these standards are a great first step and they really are needed because it it points us in the right direction it goes mm -hmm. yes accountability is something we want to achieve when it comes to implementing that it gets a bit hazier and it goes okay how do we implement accountability how do we make sure that we reach that definition how does it work in our own industry um so just creating for example your your code of ethics or just saying that you follow for example the high level expert groups seven principles of ethical ai is a great step forward but you need to be asking yourself how are we actually doing that in the company both from from a company culture perspective to a management perspective um are we actually embodying these principles or are we just meeting that barely meeting that bare minimum standard um so it's it's not something to become complacent on that is the risk with these with these policies with these standards that uh you, it creates this complacency of oh we just met the standards we're fine when really it's an ongoing process it's ongoing work uh, olivia let me go back to a point uh, we were discussing uh, very early in this conversation where you said that the two areas you work on at eia are training and protocols so like you are currently working on xyz uh, things when it comes to training programs similarly there may be other people other organizations in the industry whether it is the it companies or consultancies who also provide ai ethics training uh, where do you think the industry what are the elements the industry is missing out that uh, maybe say uh, your company is providing uh, uh, any particular element that comes to your mind in that sense so what we provide is this very interdisciplinary perspective um our entire team is made up of people from all sorts of backgrounds academically speaking um from our educational backgrounds so when we approach these subjects and we go to actually educate and teach about them we aren't just saying here is for example virtue ethics theory 
Uh, here are all of the philosophers that you can read on it. Um, here are the principles that sit within virtue ethics theory. It's no, here is the concept of virtue ethics. Mm -hmm. And here's what that looks like in technology. Specifically, here are the different examples that we can give of it. Um, here is the perspective of a programmer teaching you virtue ethics. Um, so being able to speak to someone in really in a language that they understand. Mm -hmm. um, for example, I speak different jargon. I have different terminology than say my colleague who comes from a programming background. Mm -hmm. So if the, the, the information, the quality and the content stays the same, but if I'm communicating, if we need to communicate to someone from say a humanities background, mm -hmm. I'm the one that, that, that is engaged versus someone from a technical background, my colleague's the one that, that's speaking because it's, it's, meeting, it's meeting the person, the, the person on the other side where they're at, approaching them rather than, than forcing them into uh, a format or a standard or a style that may not necessarily communicate the, the real issues. Yeah. Um, so that, that is one perspective, uh, one, one offering that we off, um, differentiates us, uh, as well as we work very closely with SMEs and startups. Um, we do with, work with the bigger organizations, but our main goal is to help equip, help reach this kind of mid-level range. Um, they're the ones that AI ethics resources are often inaccessible or unaffordable at, the, at this point in time. So we're working very closely to try and bridge that gap now, um, mm -hmm. reaching these guys in the, in the middle range who want to do well, want to, want to do good by their tech, and need the resources to be able to do that. Um, so that's where we differ a bit from our, our fellow AI ethics firms um, in, in this space. And any examples of companies uh, you feel that who have actually put in place very good AI, I mean, they could be your clients or they could be generally companies in the world uh, who have put in place very good AI ethical uh, training practices? Yes, um, so they we haven't worked they're not one of our clients, but uh, good friends, so to speak, if you can say that in a professional setting. Uh, the company is called Hypergiant down in Austin, Texas. Um, they have done a fabulous job in this area. So they work in space tech, AI for, for outer space, which is a really cool topic anyway. But they have a department um, headed up by a man named Will Griffin. Uh, he is their chief ethics and diversity officer. He has done an amazing job. He's implemented this code of ethics that the company worked on and developed together. And what he does is he helps train the employees, the, the engineers really, on how to follow this code of ethics. Um, and he actually noticed, so when he was first developing this code, what, when, when Hypergiant was first developing this code of ethics, um, they were taking stock. So they ran two quarters with their engineering department saying, okay, here's the problem. What are the solutions? And their engineering department was coming back with four to five good solutions. They were good solutions. Mm -hmm. And then the following two quarters, they put in place the code of ethics and trained their employees against this code of ethics. And Will, as he says, uh, the following two quarters that they implemented this they would go again to their engineering department. Here's the problem. And instead of getting, you know, four to five good solutions, mm -hmm. they were getting 10, 12 robust, beautiful solutions out of their engineering department. And they saw a change in the, the employees as well, where it was this creativity, it was this excitement, it was this feeling of, okay, I have confidence in the solution that I am turning out to you. Mm -hmm. um, so I always love giving Hypergiant as an example um, and you can check out their website. They have their code of ethics published. They're very, very active. Will himself is very active uh, promoting this kind of approach to work, uh, approach to technology. Um, they're, they're a fantastic example of a company that's doing it right. Yeah, the fact that they're disclosing the code is also something to be worth no, uh, uh, noting. Um, and let's come to the other part. Uh, so, I mean, you work on say ethical protocols. Um, are these solutions uh, like in a sense open source or 
once you have given a set of protocols to x you know avc company that is uh, you know their property and you cannot use that template in any other uh, company say uh, uh, how does the entire dynamics work in this line so it depends on the client that we work with mm -hmm. um no matter what what we do is we keep all of the ip and we license it out um, we allow our clients though to make the decision if they will open source it themselves on their end mm -hmm. um, for example the collaborative has theirs open sourced uh, however we worked with franklin templeton investments and the framework that we created for them is internal it's part of their due diligence system now um, but it's not open sourced so it depends on the client mm -hmm. um, the oftentimes, oftentimes what happens is uh, sometimes these frameworks and protocols require sensitive information within them mm -hmm. about the company. Mm -hmm. um, but it, again, it, it really depends on, on the client. And any particular example of company that, again, you feel stands out, maybe your client or maybe generally in the industry, in terms of who have actually established or institutionalized very good set of protocols in recent times? I mean, I'll just, I'll just continue on with the example of Franklin Templeton now that I've brought them up. Um, so we worked with their ESG department mm -hmm. and what they were looking to do was create an investment portfolio of AI startups. And for them, it was very, very important that the startups that they were putting into these portfolios aligned not only with Franklin Templeton's values, but with their client values. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we worked with them to establish uh, actually build off of their security due, due diligence that, that was already in place. Mm -hmm. And we built an extra layer onto it um, mm -hmm. that allowed them to check and make sure that these startups, that, they, that these AI companies were aligning with the values and the value systems of Franklin mm -hmm. and their clients. And so now what that does is it adds an extra layer of protection in both directions and it keeps that conversation even more transparent than it would have been before. They know where they're coming from, from both ends. Um, so Franklin Templeton did a great job uh, and, it, and are currently employing that um, still to this, still well, currently in their ESG department. Um, so that's that's a great example from so, the more- so, the, uh, so that particular fund, uh, the ESG fund was actually investing in AI startups, if I understand it correctly. Yes, yeah. E ESG AI startups. It, Big long title. Oh, okay, okay. But, but it's I mean it's interesting that you brought up the finance sector because the fi I mean I come from a finance sector myself uh, originally, and finance sector probably is sometimes the I mean in the I mean in the most of controversy when it comes to responsible and uh, you know uh, these sort of practices that while they have institutionalized a lot of frameworks a lot of processes invariably a lot of lapses also get found out in the financial sector rather uh, more than uh, many other sectors. So um, while Franklin Templeton may have done a step in the right direction, what is your view on the overall financial sector in this context? Do you think the other uh, BFSI organizations uh, that you may have engaged with or generally also in the universe are actually taking a step in this direction in the right manner? Yes, so actually the two industries, finance is one of them and health tech is the other one that are really the first, the, the vanguards of this movement. Oh. Um, they are the first ones at the door going, we need these frameworks, we need this help. Um, from an ethical point standpoint, that's because our finance, our, our health, our physical health are so closely connected with our individual well-being that the finance sector and the health sector are the greatest at risk for if they misstep in terms of ethically handling people and their data, then those are missteps that are very hard to recover from and often result in very, very extreme negative impacts on, on their own clients, on their user base. So in the finance and the health and the health sectors, their risks, the stakes for them are so much higher than say, uh, well, HR, HR is um, important, but from an HR operations standpoint, those, those, even those directions, but also in industries, say uh, food or, or beauty or something, there's, there's, there's a lower risk. So the stakes aren't as high, but finance and health, they are the first at the door going, 
we need to make sure that we're doing this correctly. Um, so they, they of course have their workout cut out for them, but are at least tuned in and are in the process of starting to create and implement a lot of these frameworks and protocols. As a matter of fact, uh, earlier in the conversation, we were just mentioning that necessity is the mother of invention and sometimes perilous situation is actually a blessing in disguise. So uh, in a sense, the ESG movement in the finance space itself has also gained a lot because of this entire post-COVID lockdown slash slowdown uh, scenario. And I, I still remember a data point that actually uh, created news in the Indian uh, media, for instance. So in India, especially the part where I am, uh, the place called Mumbai, it remains in lockdown for the seventh straight month as we speak. The first three, four months, uh, so Mumbai is where the stock exchanges are. Uh, the mm -hmm. ESG index actually outperformed the normal uh, base index in the, in, in the first three, four months. After that, uh, right now, I'm not too sure exactly what is the latest. I'm sure it is still outperforming. And that has brought the uh, entire whole lot of attention of both in retail and institutional in investors on the ESG side. A lot of now suddenly that space is uh, picking up. So the difficult times sometimes spell uh, blessings for uh, some sectors, but hopefully we don't, uh, you know, revisit such difficult times in the near future uh, like we did in 2020. Uh, Olivia, with that, we'll conclude uh, this conversation. A uh, lot of thanks to you for taking out the time today uh, for discussing and sharing all your wonderful insights. Uh, if I may add, you know, in the big four, uh, I mean, in the management consulting space, there is a big four. Uh, I mean, originally it was big five, but then it became big four. Um, I hope that in a few years time, if there becomes a big four, in the AI ethics consulting space, then EIA would be one of them. And I wish you all the very best, you and your team, that hopefully, you know, you're able to scale to that heights. With that, uh, thanks again, and I wish you a very good week ahead. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarjit. And thank you for this lovely hour of conversation. And best of you, as best of luck as well to you and Fair AI. <laughs>